I think that a lot of the struggle for people isn't that they're not making progress. It's just that it's not happening fast enough for them. You can tell people the answer or you can help them find the right answer. But when people find their answer, you internalize it and you get better. Hey folks, this is Abe Shreve. Welcome to another episode of the Choose Difficult Podcast. The path to success is not easy. Here we explore the stories of those who chose difficult and changed the world that they live in. Today we're coming to you from beautiful Ogden, Utah, and the voice you've just heard is that of Jay Papazan. Now, if that name sounds familiar, most likely you've read one of the several New York Times bestselling books that he has co-authored. Jay has helped write books like The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, Shift, and most recently, The One Thing with his partner, and actually my partner in business, Gary Keller. The One Thing has sold over 2 million copies and has been translated into 39 different languages. And it is a masterwork on how to identify a priority and then how to lock the world out until you get it accomplished. It's a go-to book for me and anyone that we work with. I've known Jay for a long time, but there was something that I learned from our mutual partner, Gary Keller, early in our relationship that really caught me off guard. Back in 1999, there was a gentleman named Bill Phillips. He published a book called Body for Life. And that book had a huge effect on me. Gary told me that Jay Papazan was one of the guys at HarperCollins that worked hand in hand with Bill Phillips to get that book written and produced and out there. In fact, I think even now that book is one of the top fitness books ever written. Jay also, while at HarperCollins, helped work on the book Go for the Goal by Mia Hamm. We're big soccer players around my house. And so when I first got Jay on the phone, I asked him, what was it like working with Bill Phillips on that project? It surprised a lot of us. Um, Jane Friedman was the editor-in-chief of HarperCollins at that time. And um, her husband or partner, his last name was Stone, I'm forgetting his name, but they're the ones who found Bill Phillips. And they approached my boss, David Hershey, um, he was executive editor and I was his associate editor at the time. So we were kind of a ta tag team and said that they wanted us to run this book. And we just knew that Bill Phillips was a kind of looked like a professional weightlifter and had a supplement company. And David Hershey like was like deputy editor of Esquire. And so like we loved our sports books, but that was we were soccer weenies. We weren't hanging out in the weight room. And so it, it felt weird. Like, why us? Why this? Like, it was, it felt like a weird mix. And I don't know that we were really happy about it. We knew it was a big book. So we took it very seriously. And it wasn't until we really started working with Bill's team, we realized what professionals they were. Hmm. Um, and he had a massive vision um, for what the book could be. So I'll give you an example. Um, two of the quirks that I appreciate in retrospect, but hated at the time he would only communicate to us via fax. We edited an entire book via fax. And there wow. were emails, right? This was in the mid nineties. There were emails already. It was still primitive, but you could have sent it by email. And his thing was he, was, he valued his time. And he said, if you get on the phone, we have to talk about the weather. And if you email me, it feels so instantaneously, you don't think about everything that needed to be in there ends up being five communications. When someone sends a fax, they write it up, they print it up, they look at it, they're thoughtful about it, and they hit send because it's awkward. So he was trying to refine communication. So at the time, imagine editing a massive book with illustrations in fax time. It was, it was surreal. But later, you know, now I work for Gary Keller, and I've learned the value of time. I'm like, wow, there was someone who placed a high value on their time and created cheats to make sure that people didn't waste it. The other one is he insisted um, there was a belly band. It basically was a piece of paper that wrapped around the book, almost like a bow. And it wrapped around the book and he wanted it to be two-sided, four color illustrations of before and after weightlifting journeys. For most books, we never do color. There might be a little insert in the middle of the book. You've seen it. You open the book in the very middle. There might be black and white. So to do this for something that was on the outside of the book, they would inevitably get torn up repeatedly as people unpacked them and put them on bookshelves or just looked at them. 
it was going to be very expensive and would create a lot of returns. And it was four color on both sides. And he fought tooth and nail. His agent, David Black, who I will tell you, there are a few people who fight harder for their clients than he did. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like him either, but I learned a lot of the best contract language for publishing from him because yeah. <laughs> like, he was like forcing that. it on us, right? Yeah. He was advocating yeah. for his clients, um, but they insisted in the vision and were willing to risk everything on it, like to back out of the project. So we did it. And it was later, like, you know, the book, yeah. people didn't yeah. know what Photoshop was back then. They didn't right. realize that some of the, the tans on people had been evened out artificially. What they saw was something inspiring. They saw Jay Papazan as he is today, right, with a little bit of a COVID-19. And then they saw him with like zero body fat, like ripped. We take the before and after so for granted, but that was revolutionary then. And people told us again and again that they took that belly band and that was their bookmark. And it was yeah. their inspiration on the journey. So hmm. the guy was way out there. He was really thinking very clearly about how he was going to connect with his clients he knew what would resonate. Like that guy, you, a bunch of us New York elite ivory tower folks were like, what the heck? Yeah. But what a great lesson. As Jay and I were talking, I shared with him that the before and after photos that you find in the inside cover and in the little jacket sleeve of the Body for Life book were really inspirational to me. In fact, as I was going through my own physical transformation at the time, I would often look back at those before and afters. They really kept me engaged. In those early years, Jay cut his teeth working with really big, important projects. But more importantly, he was able to take the lessons he learned at HarperCollins into his new partnership as a writing partner to Gary Keller. A lot of those lessons I later got to apply in my partnership with Gary. In the very opening, it was like 10 myths around weightlifting or something like that. It was very provocative. Bill Phillips was the first person to put forward that you would burn more fat lifting weights than doing cardio. That was something that uh, caught Gary's eye when we were planning our first books. He loved it because it challenged the reader. And it yeah. immediately said, I know something you don't know. I'm going to surprise you. It's a surprising truth that we wanted to present right up front. I love this idea of starting into new material by understanding what are the myths and the truths. What are these things that we think are true? It's, it's, a way, it's a way to engage your reader or your listener so that they are immediately questioning these assumptions that they probably have lived with for a long time. In fact, here in our company, we've made it a part of our model when we're creating courses, when we're creating new material. The very first thing we do is we go and identify what are the myths that hold people back and what are the truths of those myths. You know, Jay shared with me some of the things that he learned working for these two very different types of people. His boss when he was at HarperCollins and then, of course, now working with the great Gary Keller. In that book that I, I was reflecting on my old boss at HarperCollins. They'd scooped him up from Esquire magazine, a very prestigious position. He was, had been deputy editor for 10 years because he had this Rolodex. And I was his assistant, basically his EA, but with editorial duties. And every day he would drop off these wads of receipts because he'd go out and meet people for breakfast. He'd go out and meet people for lunch. He'd go out and meet people for happy hour and he'd go out for dinner with them. It was New York City. Like he never ate at home. And I remember one year his receipts for magazines and lunches and dinners added up to more than my salary. You don't get paid a lot in publishing. And I was at the very bottom rung of the ladder, right, on editorial. I'm not saying he was crazy with his expenses. It was normal. But at the time, I resented it because I had to call the restaurants when he got the receipt. And I would have to go fetch. It was just a big administrative job. And yeah. then Gary walks me through the book that I'm helping him write, he and Dave. And I'm like, he was lead generating. That's why he was executive editor. Every moment of every day, uh -huh. he was networking because he wanted the best books. All right, let's hit the pause button for just a second. I've known Jay for quite a number of years, and I want to point out something I think he does extremely well that is a benefit to anyone who's learning based. In this moment, you see Jay looking back and extracting the learning. 
as he is reviewing his previous work experience, he's reflecting on what was the lesson learned. It's a little obvious in a podcast, but this is something that I have seen Jay do over and over again. It's something that I've adopted as well. People that are growth-minded are always going back, cataloging the learning and seeking to understand what did I learn in that moment that I can take forward. His experience at HarperCollins placed him in a perfect position to be able to work with someone that would change the entire state of the real estate industry named Gary Keller. Their first project together was a book that would set the table for the rest of their working relationship. What Gary credits the book for is it made us relevant with the top agents in the industry. It started a conversation where we could, everybody could compare their businesses with each other, which is something the top agents wanted to do. And I think you put it earlier, he was trying to get salespeople to start thinking like business people. So it's just a good business book. That's what a great coach does for us, right? Um, in this case, a book can be a kind of coaching. It gives us a for new sure. framework. It can give us a new paradigm so that we can properly understand our world. That just gave me a whole new lens. I was like, oh, now I'm looking at businesses like businesses. The book that Jay keeps referring to is called The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. And it was co-authored by Gary Keller, Dave Jenks, and of course, Jay Papazon. Gary told me himself that they had hit a wall. They'd stopped progressing on the book. And it wasn't until they introduced Jay to the team that they really started making their strides and assembling the book in the order that it would later come out and rise to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. I find Jay to be a very authentic leader. He's a person that I've seen work very hard to live in his everyday life, the principles that he writes about in his books and that he teaches to those that he leads. The world of self-improvement is full of great ideas that are even backed by true principle. But it's a special leader that lives by example. It's important that we are not just thought leaders. It's important that we actually show by example how to live a life based on the principles that we teach. This is actually one of the reasons why Gary Keller resonated with Jay as, as a leader because it was just as important to Gary as it was to Jay that they actually live the principles that they're writing about. He's a very transparent leader. His expectations are that if we are going to write books that tell people what to do as a team, we're going to be living those books. And it's okay if we're failing, right? I mean, it, you can't not be trying. You can't tell someone, this is the best dog food in the world, and then feed something else to your pets, right? We're going to be concentric, as he would put it. All right, so hang on. If you're driving, if you can pull over, do it. If you're just in your office, close the door. Just take a moment. And I really want to shine a light on what Jay has just said. He said, it's okay to fail. And I, I've learned that from Jay. I've learned that from others. I've actually learned that directly working with Gary Keller myself. You have to fail. So many of us get paralysis by analysis. We get so focused on having to have something absolutely perfect before it goes out that we don't produce things, we don't complete projects. And I love that Jay talked about how you have to fail, it's okay to fail, it's important to fail, and you have to try things. That's the important thing, have a plan. If you try your plan and it doesn't lead you where you wanna go, now you can adjust. It's easier to edit a plan than it is to come up with an entirely new one. So Gary really wasn't looking for someone just to take dictation and to write his words. When it came to finding the right partner for producing his books from that point forward, Gary was looking for more than that. Gary was very clear that he wanted a partner that wasn't just someone who was a wordsmith. Most writers think that being a writer is about writing. But if you're going to be a successful author, there's a lot of other things. It's a business. One of my yeah. friends, Todd Satterston, our publisher, he wrote a book that called Every Book is a Startup. And he thinks of it that way right? That you launch a book, it's like launching a business and you should treat it that way. So the year after Dave retired, Gary does an annual speech called the vision speech. That's our whole company's watching. We were in Florida. I remember getting the call at about five in the morning that I was going to be on stage at 8 a.m. in front of 8,000 people with him to support him. I was incredibly just sick at my stomach, right? I didn't like to be on stage. I didn't have any desire to be on stage. And, but I did it and I survived it. And afterwards, I kind of confronted him, Abe. I said, please, Gary, don't ever do that to me again. I was hot. 
I'd asked him a thousand times, do you want me to help you? Because Dave's not there. He's, no, I got it. No, I got it. And then he changed his, his mind the morning of. Yeah. And he goes, I can't do that. You say you want to be an author. And authors don't just write words. If they're going to be successful, that's a skill you're going to have to learn. So get used to it. What I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear right then. But I remember going back, and this was about the time I was getting a coach. I think my first coach, I'm trying to think exactly when that happened, but I did make a commitment then to teach a minimum of one time a month in front of any audience I could find Mm. because I refused to be that terrified again. That started that journey for me to kind of master the art of, it's just a hat you can wear. Um, It doesn't mean I'm an extrovert. It means I have something I want to share and I want to do it well. That's the way I interpret it. And you just then work on the skills. If you haven't noticed yet, there are a lot of circular relationships occurring in this story. Gary Keller is my business partner in, in my business. Jay is a partner in that business. I currently have the benefit of serving as Jay's business coach. Jay is someone that I go to often as a mentor and for leadership and guidance as a partner in our business. I'm a partner in his business. I mean, I've known Jay for a long time, and I would have never guessed there was ever a time in his life that he wasn't completely comfortable teaching and speaking from stage. In fact, I remember the very first time that I was interviewed on stage. There were about 18,000 people in the audience, and it was Gary Keller, and there were a few of us on stage, and Jay was on stage, as he always is with Gary. And I remember uh, Gary had asked me a question, and I'd given an answer. And at this time, Jay and I didn't know each other that well, but I, I kind of just looked over, and he gave me a slight wink and a slight nod, and it just gave me strength Because I thought if somebody that good, if someone that plugged in, if someone that experienced on stage thought that was okay, I'm going to be all right up here. So you can imagine how shocking it was to me in this conversation to learn that was something that he had to commit to getting good at. There's a theme that's occurring here. Have you seen it? At every stage of Jay's professional development, he identifies something that he wants to improve in or, or an area that's difficult for him. He makes a decision to improve, lays out a plan, surrounds himself with the right people to support him in it, and leans into the heavy lifting of doing those things that are previously difficult for him. The number one thing is that I'm actually an introvert. Um, I had coffee with, she's a famous author. Her name's Vanessa Van Edwards. Maybe you've read her book, Captivate. It's really good the science of connecting. And she's like, no, you're not. You're an ambivert. I'm like, I hate to tell you, I know that ambiverts between introvert and extrovert, if you've never heard of it, but I'm not, I am actually an introvert. And I mean, I've taken a dozen behavioral assessments and that's usually my defining characteristic. And much of what I've learned to do in business is either succeed through others. If those things require the kind of sociability, I just can't bring up all the time, or I have to connect to those activities around something else other than being social. You know, Mm -hmm. like I can do podcast interviews, I can do interviews, I can do one-on-ones, I can teach classes because I'm really passionate about the message. If I wasn't passionate about the one thing and how it had changed my life and my family's life, it wouldn't matter how much people paid me, I wouldn't go speak and do corporate stuff. It's too uncomfortable still after all these years. But if it matters to you, you'll do it and you'll find ways to cope. We all have crutches. And nobody is this unicorn that was perfectly made to do all of these things. I mean, if I was the unicorn author, I'd also have a British accent so that my speaking, it wouldn't even matter if I was speaking well, because we all know that they're more charming, right? So you just look up and that's kind of where you are. And I'm like, well, I've got some pieces of the puzzle and I know that it's really important to me to do this thing. So I've been on a long journey, an uncomfortable one to kind of fill in some of the gaps or find people that fill those gaps for me. There's, there's two ways to do it. I want you to notice that Jay used the words, a long and uncomfortable journey to fill in the gaps. He's talking about adding to his personal resume of offerings the skill of presenting in person, being on stage with his writing partner, Gary, learning how to teach, learning how to step outside of himself, He's a really gifted author. He's a talented researcher. And this is an area that he viewed in his life as something that could hold him back. Therefore, he leaned into a long, uncomfortable journey. He decided to do the work. 
I think so often we will label ourselves a certain way. We'll say things like, I'm not a numbers person or I don't speak publicly because I'm an introvert like Jay has talked about here. And in so labeling, what we've really done is we've built comfort walls around us so that it's understandable why we don't do certain things. But Jay's not a person that lives like that. He, he is a person that looks at what he wants to become and identifies a pathway to it. And this is important because there are areas of our lives for every one of us that we can go back in the history of, of our lives and find a time we weren't good at things we're good at now. In fact, take a look at your personal business. I promise you there was a time in your business life that you weren't able to do what you're doing today. One of the things that I really love about Jay and the way he thinks is he's not going to hold himself back by limiting what he can be because of what he doesn't know. He leans into the heavy lifting of learning, the challenge of learning through doing, and in many cases, he goes and finds a coach and a mentor to help speed up the learning process. This is something that's really important to Jay, and this was something that was also really and still is really important to his writing partner, Gary Keller. The reason I think Gary leans into coaching so much is he understands that you can tell people the answer or you can help them find the right answer. But when people find their answer, either through questions or like, he's not going to let you drive off a cliff, but he's going to let you bark your shins on the coffee table in the dark. So you learn to turn the light switch on. He's going to let you learn the lesson so that you internalize it and you get better. He's willing to invest in your learning. And that is something that very much I think of as central to his leadership style. Have you ever felt like you've got more in you? Like there's more you can do. There's things you can know. You'll, you'll know if you have these frustrations because you'll look at areas of your life and think, my life would be so much better if I was on top of my budget. I would be so much better off if I would read more or if I was a better speaker, a better presenter, a better teacher, a better leader. Yet all of these things are skill-based. And part of what I think keeps people from becoming better at these things is the fear of the effort required to get good at them. We live in a society, we live in a time and age where we want everything, but we want it right now. We would like to skip the struggle. And we don't have that luxury. It takes time. Jay is committed to becoming who he knows he can become. And he's committed to the time that it takes to become that. And he works on it every single day. He's not the same person he was one year ago. And he will not be the same person that he is today in a year from now. It takes time. I think that a lot of the struggle for people isn't that they're not making progress. It's just that it's not happening fast enough for them. You know, this is a Garyism, right? But I mean, I think a lot of people vastly overestimate what they can get done in one year, but they exponentially underestimate what they could accomplish in four or five. If you just stick with it, the journey, that four or five years, it feels like forever. Like you think about, Abe, I want you to give me a five-year plan to go from, you know, here to here. It feels like forever. It's really hard to connect with yeah. five years from now. But that is kind of the secret. It's more about dealing with our impatience. It's like money. Yeah. Compound interest doesn't work overnight. It works no. over time. But we can grow at that same kind of compounding if we're willing to make the same investments day in and day out with an eye towards getting better. Like just showing up and hitting golf balls will not make you a pro golfer. You actually no. have to show up and hit golf balls with the intent to get better. And you can be at least on that journey. You may be on a 78 year plan. I would be on a 150 year plan to be a pro golfer, meaning it's not going to happen, right. but I can continue to get better and might surprise myself. So wouldn't it be great if somebody would write a book that would just tell us how do we pick something how do we identify the most important thing and how do we just focus on that until it's all done? Wouldn't that be great? We've talked about the struggle of learning and we've talked about uh, the importance of partnership and coaching and mentorship and growth and all those things. How do you do it? Well, turns out that would be the next book that Gary and Jay would write, a book that today has sold over 2.3 million copies. It's called The One Thing. I love this book. And I asked Jay, where did you come up with the idea to actually write about this? The book came out of an essay that Gary wrote. I was working on a course for our company. He wanted to write an intro to it. 
And he came back with like a 10 or a 14 page handwritten essay called The Power of One. And it was really about, you and I both know this because we're inside the bubble, but it's like, it was about lead generation, like making sure that every day you got your lead generation done to grow your business. Before everything else, that was the one thing. And his observation was the people who achieved the most, all business people always made that their first thing until it was done and then they could do other stuff. And I remember coming back on Monday and reading it and going, Gary, this could be a book. You know, the little antenna in my publishing brain were going off because at that time I've been working with them for, I don't know, seven or eight years. And he has many things that are above average, but the thing that I believed truly distinguished him was his ability to identify a priority and give it more attention and resources than anybody else was. And that's kind of the one thing in a nutshell. So as a publisher, my publisher brain was like, this explains his success. This is, if he goes on Oprah, no one's going to call him a fake. Like he is the guy and this is how he does it. This is like his secret sauce. Well, we then went on a five-year journey. And remember, I admitted, we wrote a book about focus and got distracted for about a year with this thing called the housing crisis and wrote a whole other best-selling book called Shift. But it was the one thing we needed to do So the five-year journey wasn't uninterrupted, but we went on this journey to write the book and the research and our experience kind of coming together was people who achieved really extraordinary success were really clear about the thing that mattered most and they didn't just do it, they made it a habit. They made it a ritual. Every day I will do this. And when you make something a habit, it just takes so much of the effort out of it, right? I don't think about brushing my teeth in the morning or evening It's something that my parents beat into me for the first 10 years of my life. So I would never have to think about it again. But having raised teenagers, I know it's a lot of effort to get your kids to brush their teeth. So there was this effort on the front end that created something that will serve me until I die. And that's the beauty thing. And so we went to this thing called Book Expo, where all of the book creators and booksellers get together for like three days and everybody gets advanced copies of everybody's books. And we took the one thing and the success habit on two giant posters to that venue. And we spent three days asking the business book buyer for Barnes and Noble and for Amazon and for Borders and for Books A Million and CEO Read, all of them, which one do you vote on? 79% voted for the success habit. We came back and um, are now VP of operations, but then director of marketing, Ellen Curtis, we were sitting down and we were sharing the research and Gary and I were just both kind of like, I hear it. We don't love to run contrary to data. Like gut is giving up thinking, right? G-U-T, give up thinking. That's a a Keith Cunningham quote. And we both were kind of shyly saying, I don't believe it. I don't think that's still the wrong choice, but then Ellen clinched it for us. She goes, if I see a book called The One Thing, I want to know what it is. That sounds like something I can do. I can get one thing done, dadgummit. The success habit kind of sounds hard. And I'm already really busy. So profound. And we had the instinct, but we couldn't back it up. But she articulated it. It's really difficult to appropriately time the need your audience has for a certain message. And... Jay explained that with both the millionaire real estate agent and the book, The One Thing, they got a little lucky on timing. I've learned luck comes a little more frequently to those that are looking, asking the right questions and studying the needs of those that they are writing for. I will tell you, our first big book, The Millionaire Agent, got lucky. Again, timing. It showed up as a solution to a problem a lot of people were discovering they had. They wanted more as a salesperson. They want to be business people. The one thing showed up in 2013, and it was about the time, like it was only a few years after the iPhone came out. We were living in a mobile society where all the barriers between work and home were falling down and people had more stuff that they could do at any moment than ever before. And as human beings, we just weren't coping so well. And so we showed up at a moment of overwhelm with a book about simplicity, about focus. And so like anybody who tells you their great success didn't have an element of luck is just lying. I mean, you just have to be honest. Ours twice, we benefited from profound timing. And I wish I could say 
Gary and all of his genius, and he is a genius, saw this coming. No, we just believed the message and the timing found us. Okay, did you catch that? Because it was important. Earlier in this episode, we, we talked about that Jay and Gary both believed that it's important if you're going to teach something, it's important that you live it, that you're not just a voice for a principle, that you actually are an example for a principle. And here, Jay very insightfully has pointed out that part of what provided the luck in their timing was they believed in the message. They believed in the message and they worked on it every day. I think whether you're writing a book or you're leading others, when you truly believe in the message that you teach, when you believe in the principles that you're teaching and you follow those up by living them, by doing the actions, you're going to be more lucky and people are going to want to join your journey. Think big, start small. I think a lot of people get frustrated. Um, they are growing. They are on the journey, um, but they just haven't hit the elbow of the curve yet, right? It is exponential. Yeah. But with any anything, growth, success, even failure, before you get to the elbow of the curve where things really start to ramp up, it feels like nothing's happening. Yeah. And so I would just say, um, if you are uncomfortable, not to the point of just being abject misery, right? But you're uncomfortable, not miserable. There is a difference. Um, you're probably in a growth stage and just focus on growing, right? Mm -hmm. And learning and learning what you need to learn and building the habits you need to build. And all I can promise them is the next plateau has just as many discomforts, but That's they're true. the kind that you control when you have the other kind of discomforts because you refuse to grow. Those are often things that we don't get to turn off or on. It's a better journey. Well, I hope you've enjoyed getting to know Jay Papazan. What an amazing story from his fairly humble beginnings of working as an administrative assistant at HarperCollins, all the way up to being a co-author of multiple New York Times bestsellers and a well-known speaker and trainer. One of the things that I really enjoyed about my time with Jay and something I've known about him for quite some time is his complete willingness to transparently share what is hard for him to share his struggles and to share what he's doing to overcome those things. I took pages of notes. I hope that you came away with something that is going to help you in your personal learning journey. Life is a powerful teacher and sometimes life is a really painful teacher, but we can learn a lot from the life and experiences of others too. And Jay is someone that I have learned a lot from. Jay and I talked a lot about The One Thing. It's one of my very favorite productivity books. Our partner, Jeff Woods, has an incredible podcast called The One Thing Podcast. I encourage you to go and look into that wherever you subscribe to podcasts. It's theonething.com. And for the podcast, the one is spelled out. They've got a great website full of incredible resources. It'd be a great place for you to stop by as well. And in that case, the one is just the number one. So the one thing podcast. Well, there you have it, folks. I hope you've enjoyed our time together. I hope you'll join us next time as we continue to explore the stories of extraordinary individuals who choose difficult. <laughs>